Hello, I'm Michael Enright. Welcome to this tribute to Margaret Lyons, the woman who 50 years ago was the driving force behind what has become known as the radio revolution. She gave new life to CBC Radio. Many say she, in fact, saved it from oblivion. When she directed the creation of such programs as As It Happens, Quirks and Quarks, Sunday Morning, and This Country in the Morning, she introduced new standards of radio journalism. Margaret Lyons was a reporter, producer, a manager, the very first vice president of CBC Radio, a fierce advocate of public broadcasting, and a woman with a story certainly worth telling. She was also a fire-breathing force of nature who let you know what she thought. You didn't trifle with Margaret. For example, she hired me, then she fired me, and then she hired me again. Margaret Lyons died in 2019 at the age of 95. She told her daughter Ruth and her husband Ed she didn't want a fuss. Well, we're sorry, Margaret, but a fuss must be made. Before we begin, I must also tell you that this documentary was made during the time of COVID-19. Everybody was properly masked and distanced, and nearly everything you will see was shot on a smartphone. I used to uh, work at uh, CBC Radio, started in 1976, and I knew about Margaret Lyons, but I had never met Margaret Lyons. And in fact, the day that I met Margaret Lyons, I didn't know that it was Margaret Lyons. And we were in the women's washroom, which was right across from the um, Morningside office, this small woman and I, and she was on, she just started to talk to me about the raccoons. And she had had raccoons in her back garden and she was furious because they were eating everything. And so she said to me, I'm going to get a rifle and shoot them all. And I thought, that's a bit extreme. And she said, well, I'm not, the man's coming. But anyway, that was the end of the conversation. And I went back into the office. I had no idea who she was. And uh, Jim Hanman said to me, you know who that was, don't you? I said, no. He said, that was Margaret Lyons. When Vicki Gabbro had her washroom encounter in the 1970s, Margaret was turning the radio service on its head. She knew what she wanted, whom she wanted, and she took no prisoners. Her high heels tapping down the corridor were Morse code for Margaret's in the building. Margaret Lyons was short. And as she always said, she had three strikes against her. She was a woman, she was under five feet tall, and she was Japanese. And she made it by God, all the way up. And she'd be walking along the hallway like that. So you always knew it was Margaret coming. Uh, one thing about Margaret is that she was incredibly when I look back at her, she was incredibly focused. When she had, she had a very clear idea of what CBC Radio ought to be, and she was determined to make it happen. And, and then, of course, she was uh, a woman uh, in a very senior management role when there were no women in senior management roles, and she was also not very tall. <laughs> I think four foot eleven is generous. I think, uh, but my gosh, she was, uh, she was, she was like a little beam of light. I mean, she with like a laser-like focus, I think dragged CBC Radio into the, the 1970s and 80s. You know, I didn't know a lot about her, but we all knew her name. And as women in the industry, we all um, really grasped the significance of what she had done to blaze that trail for, for many of us that were coming in behind her. Margaret was one of the smartest women ever and she was always low key but you knew what she was thinking and she would go like that and she'd say okay do it i see her smiling i see her puckish i see her striding up to you and standing like two feet so what's new or so what's happening and there was that mixture of almost school childish sort of so what's happening 
Uh, uh, I mean, her reputation was as a drag queen, but she would be quite elfin too. I mean, she was she was sort of really what's happening. She was this, uh, this, this very, very tiny pile driver, this kind of force of nature. She was great to work with. Uh, she, uh, she, loved, she loved the CBC. She loved what she was doing. She loved what the job enabled her to do. And it was one of the things that made her very, very happy. I think that audaciousness she actually loved and admired in others, but she she didn't want to say, run with it. She wanted you to prove to her that you were up to the job of running with it, and then she would back you. Like, that's a tough, serious leader. There was no question that she had very hard-won and real views about things that she wasn't about to give up. You know, she was not a person who, uh, uh, who who liked to be told what to do ever, uh, and uh, uh, and and uh, and public broadcasting was a perfect vehicle for her view of the world. I think you can make the very clear case that she was she was the most important and the most influential uh, CBC radio executive over the past sixty years. Well, I should first of all say that I was brought up pure Japanese or Japanese Canadian, um, no English spoken until I went to, until I went to kindergarten, um, and I come from a very traditional Buddhist background, at least on my mother's side, which was the most the more influential side. My grandparents, my grandfather was very influential in, in Buddhist community, both in Mission City, my village and uh, in the uh, Buddhist community generally in the Lower Mainland. She was born Keiko Margaret Inoue in the late fall of 1923, the eldest of six children, daughter of a strawberry farmer in the Fraser Valley of British Columbia. His father had cleared the land by hand. There was no electricity, no running water. They were two miles outside of Mission, B.C. Um, it was a hard life. Farming life was very hard. Everybody had to put their hands to farm work. Um, but my, both my parents, my mother especially, was very, very uh, achievement-oriented. She wanted us to succeed, but not so, to succeed so well that the women became too lippy. And that was my problem, you see. My grandmother, her mother, never really learned to speak English and didn't have to because she was living really outside of the English-speaking community. The farmers got together and organized a co-op, which they called the Nokai. They uh, gave, provided all the social services. They built the country, cultural center, etc. They hired a Baptist, a retired Baptist missionary, a lovely lady called Mrs. Barnett, and she taught all of us our numbers and our letters, uh, our alphabet, and we you know, most of us were, who went there were Buddhist, I guess, although there were others too. And we grew up, we learned English singing, Jesus loves me, etc., etc. <laughs> After school, we kept very much to ourselves. We didn't mix socially. My best, very best friend was not Japanese. And uh, uh, because I was always the smallest in the class, and she was always, the, she was the biggest. So she sort of physically protected me. Not that I needed protection, I don't think, because I was perfectly capable of slaughtering anybody verbally. I know that she says that, uh, she said in several places, in print and to me in person, that um, her father was gender blind. I think she, she said he was gender blind. And he didn't really care that she wasn't a boy. And I think he was fairly well educated for the time. And he treated her as a, I guess, as a boy who was going to go off and do things. And so um, I know that he, um, I, I guess he read Japanese language newspapers and he subscribed to 
I think it was Vancouver province for her, and she read all the English language, language newspapers and just got it into her head that she wanted to be a journalist. I don't know where I picked up the idea, but I've always wanted to be a journalist because as long as I can remember, I was meddling around in school newspapers. It didn't seem to occur to her in the 1930s that it might be difficult for a young woman to become a journalist, let alone a young Japanese woman. Her daughter maintains that the idea of journalism as a service to the community, what became public broadcasting, also grew out of her childhood. She didn't talk about this much, you know, her Buddhist background, but the idea of the Sangha, the community, um, and that we are all responsible, we're responsible to that, to the Sangha, to the community. She saw the CBC exactly the same way, that it was this amazing resource that we all had access to and that we all owned a piece of and had, and that it had a responsibility to all Canadians. Um, that was her, many ways, that was her public face, but her public face, I think, was driven very much by the culture that she came from. I'm thinking, I'm hearing her over my shoulder saying, how dare you speak for me? <laughs> I didn't mean that at all, she's saying. <laughs> One day, long after Margaret had retired, I'd have lunch with her about two, three times a year. We were reminiscing about the rather rickety old radio building. And uh, she said, oh yeah, those studios were terrible for soundproofing. Like for example, I had, to, uh, I had to pound on the walls just to get Glenn Gould to turn down the volume. And I said, what? Yeah, I mean, he'd be practicing all the time and it'd be really loud and you couldn't get anything recorded. So I would thump on the walls. I, said, I remember this vividly. You thumped on the walls of the studio in the middle of a Glenn Gould performance, well, or a recital, or whatever it was, it was too loud. I never forgot that. And as you know, many Glenn Gould recordings have thumping and sighing and everything else in them. And I used to think it was just his feet in his chair, and they probably are, but I like to now think occasionally, I see in my little window of my mind, Margaret thumping on the wall of Studio Q or Studio whatever it was. We looked out of the back of the truck, which had come to collect us. We were going to be voluntarily evacuated. Keiko Margaret Inoue turned 18 two weeks before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941. It was a mild spring day with a thin drizzle washing the new maple leaves on the hill behind our house, the house which we were leaving complete with furniture and all our belongings. Annie, my pet spaniel, looked at us and whined. She whined because we were not taking her. We were not allowed to take our pets. I found out later that they shot her. I think my mother was very traumatized by what happened to her. She was the oldest. She was kind of in charge of the family um, because her mother couldn't speak English. Her father was in the interior of BC when they were all sent away, when they had to leave their, their family farm. And, um, you know, my mother was really in charge. I, I think she was always in charge. And so that that's what you do when you're in charge, right? You just take charge and you do what needs to be done. The railway station was crowded with our friends and relatives who would also be voluntarily evacuated soon. If they did not volunteer to go away, leaving everything, they would be sent to relocation camps. She wrote this account of their departure in 1951, nine years after the train left. Last week, I had stood on this same platform with some magazines and fruit for a friend who was in the first group to go. And now it was our turn. We waited for the train to come, and I stood and talked with my friends, but we had nothing to say. The train load of evacuees was sent to Winnipeg. Able-bodied men were picked off for farm work. The Inouye family was all women and children. 
Margaret and her 16-year-old sister were taken on as domestics by a wealthy grain family in the new development of Tuxedo, Manitoba, but not before the municipal council debated and eventually passed a bylaw permitting these two dangerous enemy aliens to live in their midst. I remember in 1988, there was a conference uh, at Millcroft Inn. I still remember that. I happened at breakfast to hear the news that Prime Minister Mulroney is going to apologize to Japanese Canadians, right? Big deal. On our way to breakfast, I ran into Margaret. I said, Margaret, you must just really feel great about this. Well, yes, she said, it's, no, it's, it's commendable, is what she would say. She wouldn't go overboard and praise. But she said, I have to tell you, it just suited my purposes, right? And I, okay, I, you know, I was, I, I think the expectations for me were that I would become a dutiful, you know, uh, Buddhist wife. And that was, there was no way that was going to happen. And so the whole internment meant I got out of that and it gave me a chance to break out. And she said, I've never forgotten this, she said, and it helped me remake myself. And on the one hand, it was, must have been very frightening for her, but on the other hand, she had a kind of a, an innate gut feeling that, you know, life as a traditional Japanese person was not what she wanted to be. And so that event, well, just a wretched event in itself, was something that gave her meaning to her life and relevance for the rest of her life. Yeah. Margaret never, as far as I can tell, never ever forgot who she was, where she came from, how tough it had been to get where she was. And, and I, she resented, I think, it probably is the correct way, people who came up the easy way. Usually they were male, usually they wore blazers, and usually they'd come from Trinity College, right? In the University of Toronto. Now, I mean, that she, she wasn't limiting herself to, to Trinity College, but that was her kind of framework. And so she had a lot, she didn't have very much time for them. I thought she, she well, even the people she hired, she looked at people who had come up the hard way, scrappers, intelligent scrappers for sure. And, and she was more drawn to those. So every step she took was tough. And, you know, unlike these people who are graduates of <laughs> Trinity College with blazers. I mean, she had to fight every step of the way. And, and so she was just a born fighter. I don't think it ever left her. In 1944, Keiko Inouye walked away from her family and her Japanese life. She left Winnipeg for Hamilton, Ontario, and McMaster University, one of the few schools in the country that would take Japanese students. She worked as a chambermaid, bought some new clothes, and became a co-ed. She joined every club in sight, became editor-in-chief of The Silhouette, the student newspaper, and at the age of 21, started to have some fun. In 1948, as a member of the McMaster International Club, she set sail for Europe. She wandered through the rubble of bomb sites in Germany, went to Versailles, and was part of the first World University Forum in France. She also had a boyfriend. Almost from her first day at McMaster, she had been dating Ed Lyons. So my dad told me they met on the first day at university and he saw this, well, in his, maybe it was his romantic remembering, but you know, that he saw this obviously Asian, probably Japanese woman sitting on a bench, very petite woman. And he went up to her and, and asked her what she was doing and who she was because he, even my father was, you know, he was Jewish through his dad, through his father's line. They were all Jews. And I think he identified with the Jewish side a lot, and he felt like an outsider himself, and that's what drew him to her, I think. I think it was more than that as well, but, I mean, you know, they were very, they spent their whole lives together. 
On a May morning in 1949, Ed and Margaret each graduated with an honors degree in economics. They took off their mortar boards, paused for lunch, and got married in the afternoon. By evening, they had left Canada to see the world. This is London. Sir Winston Churchill has resigned from the position of Prime Minister. This news was contained in a statement put out from Buckingham Palace at half past five this evening. Living in London, Margaret Lyons discovered radio. She found out that the BBC had a North American service, and she figured anyone with a reasonable education could do that, and so knocked on the front door. The BBC said, come back when you know something about radio. Well, then she tried the back door. 65 Garvin Road. London, W6, 8th of October, 1951. Dear Mrs. Evans, I received word today from BBC that they had an opening for typists on their 12-hour shifts. In those days, BBC journalists didn't type. They dictated. Margaret Lyons could type. She had a job. Her daughter was born the same year. The Lyons lived an English life, holidays at the Isle of Wight, cheap tickets to the theater. The BBC needed a clerk in French news. Well, someone said to Margaret, you're a Canadian, you speak French. She lied through her teeth and got the job. She faked her way into the Japanese section. They dressed her up and treated her like a pet. Eventually, she was sent to BBC's in-house training program to learn, quote, the art of production and she went head-to-head -head with young men from Oxbridge for a job. Margaret Lyons, BBC producer, salary £870 a year. She interviewed the Archbishop of Canterbury, Bertrand Russell, and Labour leaders. She was earning her journalistic chops. Then she went up against Lee Kuan Yew, who was leading negotiations for the independence of Singapore. He was a really awful person. And he came to be interviewed and wanted to tell us, tell me how, what he should say. And I said, oh, no, no, that's not how we operate. You know, we have editorial control. Uh, then he accused me publicly in a press conference of being a Von Du, a sellout to my roots because I should favor Asians against the whites. And I said, thank you very much, but I think you're being racist anyway. He tried to organize, organize uh, the broadcast to be in favor of the independence movement. And there was field work, reporting with a 20-pound Niagara tape recorder over her shoulder. I think my first conversation with her, and it seemed to me it was out on the street, and she was asking me before I went into the North. So I was sent to Inuvik for half a year to be an announcer operator. <laughs> but I took the Nagra tape recorder, which was quarter inch. It was a very heavy piece of equipment for a short person to be tramping around the tundra getting stories with. Um, but she asked me one time how I got my stories in in Uvic, for example, and of course you were live on the air doing your shift. So I said, you know, I had to lug this uh, Nagra and it was so heavy and the tundra's kind of spongy and you'd be going out to cover the reindeer roundup, for example, and you'd land in a little float plane and get caught on a sandbar and have to haul this thing through, you know, muskeg. And she, she said to me, oh, I remember how how heavy those Nagras were, she said. I used to have to lug one around in Baghdad in the 50s. And I thought, here's me talking about being, you know, at the bottom of the totem pole in, in Nuvik, and she's doing documentaries for the BBC in Baghdad in the 50s. And it was then that I realized the, the sort of chasm between our experience and her sophistication. But she was so unpretentious about her skills and talent. This is the BBC Home and Forces Programme. 
Here is the news, and this is John Snay reading it. I consider that I was really, truly uh, educated in London, both in the arts, and I'm forever grateful to the BBC for allowing me to meet uh, all the major figures of that period in the course of my work. It was really a great experience because that was the period. I worked through Suez. I worked uh, during the period, uh, the final stages of the liberation, the independence of a lot of, of the smaller countries. So I almost felt, since I followed and covered all this, I almost felt part of the independence movement. She met Lester Pearson, uh, the Prime Minister. When he got the Nobel Prize, she interviewed him, and he, after the interview, said, you know, what are you doing here? You should come back to Canada and work in public broadcasting in Canada. So I gather she took his advice. <laughs> His admonition stayed with me. I was a producer, as I say, and that was when he said that as a Canadian, I ought to be at home. He implied that it was a rather colonial thing to be doing for a Canadian to be working in London. Ten years away from Canada also gave her time to reflect on her personal identity. In pre-war British Columbia, I did not like being Japanese. She wrote a piece for the New Statesman. Being Japanese then meant that you lived in an emotional ghetto where your white friends never quite accepted you and your parents would not let you join them. And you knew that when you grew up, you could have a university degree, but you could not vote. For 16 years, I was steadily becoming more European and had adjusted myself to wearing this Japanese skin. The more European I became, the less I resented my Japanese origin. In 1960, Margaret and Ed Lyons, together with their nine-year-old daughter and 18-month-old son, were back in Canada. She was a journalist looking for a job. TV was the place to be. At 30-something, she had been dismissed by BBC television as an old fogey. CBC TV didn't want her either, but CBC Radio snapped her up. CBC Radio was in trouble. It had lost the thread. There were 11 different programs on the network between 9 in the morning and noon. The Toronto Morning Show was called Toast and Jamboree Radio, designed to send you on your way with a smile on your happy face. But nobody was listening. The message from the board was, justify your existence or we cancel radio. While management pondered, Margaret was in the radio building producing what she called her long-winded documentaries. A biography of Bible Bill Eberhardt, a somewhat salacious piece about Ontario Premier Mitch Hepburn, and two hours on the Iroquois. Then there was the interview with Jimmy Hoffa. And when she produced Radio Free Fridays, Peter Zosky's infamous debrief of Moses Neimer According to him, that it had the kind of property on the potency-enhancing powers of the waters of Yugoslavia. And, uh, what do you do with it? Do you drink it or wash in it? Well, I haven't done either in it. Uh, <laughs> what does one do in it? <laughs> what happened is that hundreds of thousands of Germans supposedly started roaring over to this town. So finally some enterprising entrepreneur approached the Yugoslav government and got them to bottle it. Uh -huh. So I picked it up, in fact, in Belgrade. Yeah, and you brought back how much? I brought back two bottles. What did you do with the two bottles? Well, uh, the first bottle I presented to my buddy, Pat Watson, mm -hmm. who couldn't make out whether the I was... Pat Watson? Yeah, the <laughs> Pat Watson, whether I was complimenting him or insulting him. <laughs> and he never let me know what When we started uh, Radio Free Friday together, I wanted a satirical item. Peter Zosky did not want a satirical item. He did not want to interview somebody with a, with a script. And, and, uh, and uh, I hired Jim Laxer to be this character, Talleyrand, who we interviewed each week about something going on in the government. And Zosky hated having to interview Z uh, Laxer, but Laxer was really good. And Margaret stood behind that all the way and, and uh, kept it going and made it clear to Peter that this was going to continue. I guess that was the dragon lady. I think he was afraid of her. But, you know, she didn't raise her voice, and she didn't come on very strong. But she would 
very definite, and the definiteness helped. Not being definition, being definite really helped her. And then, of course, she listened to everything. So the next week, uh, she would talk about how you did the last week. She would uh, ha let us have our say, and then she came in with her questions. And, uh, there, you know, is this... Uh, uh, it's a very American story. Uh, do you got anything Canadian to talk about? That was number one. Number two um, was uh, uh, the person you're interviewing. They sound a little precious, and don't you don't you think that you can find somebody who uh, sounds more like ordinary people? You were asking earlier, was I interested in changing the radio service? I first became aware of the need to change uh, when Peter Meggs and Jack Crane together decided that the radio was moribund. Jack Crane, then director of radio, commissioned what became known as the Ward Meggs Report. Meggs was Peter Meggs, then program director, and Doug Ward, still in his 20s, with only a few years' radio experience under his belt. Uh, we went and we sat in every performance studio across the country. The, 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 uh, the grand piano had been pushed into the corner and there were 25 people sitting on the floor uh, all talking about ideas for new programming, for a new age. And, and, uh, and I remember Megs would say, uh, could you give us a memo on that when we leave? Because we didn't have anybody taking notes. He said, here's my memo. I wrote it three years ago to my, my, the head of the station, and it's been sitting on his desk ever since. But then there was great resistance from outside the corporation. Nobody ever got to see our report. It was a confidential document. It still is, 50 years later. The Ward Meggs report recommended major changes. For example, getting rid of commercials. That was a battle. Uh, Jack Crane commissioned the famous Ward Meggs report. And toward the latter part of that, I was recruited by Peter Miggs to help him think about what could be done to the schedule. And that was in the early 70s. She had some really tough things to do. She had to get some peace within the, the house of the network departments because they were all going to lose airtime. They were not happy with the way Margaret uh, changed that schedule around. Margaret, I think, almost enjoyed the, the fact that she, was, she could duke it out with, with her own area heads, with the unions, uh, with, with listener groups, and, and know that her back was covered, but, and it was. And I think that was important. Uh, if uh, Peter Meggs, mm -hmm. Alan Brown, and Jack Crane, uh, and, and ultimately uh, 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 the president hadn't been backing her, it would have been a much harder thing. But she... She, they were glad to have her as, as the pit bull who, who, who took this forward. A lot of the people were a little put out, literally and figuratively, by it, because she didn't stand a lot of people that she thought were not doing their job. The radio revolution was probably all due to Margaret and her real fighting stamina. None of them had the kind of the passion, the single-mindedness, the inner conviction that Margaret had to make things happen that needed to be done. And that was what was so impressive. And I think Jack probably just shook his head at, I, I'm not prepared to make the kind of choices that she made to hurt people. I, I won't do that. Well, she was, and, and, and the legacy is there because of it. And I, I, I didn't know that she actually had a softer side. I think it was very well hidden. Occasionally it came out, really came out. Not very often, but enough that I, I saw it. A note would appear, something personal had happened, and, she, and Erna, my wife, said, oh my God, is this the same Margaret Lyons? I mean, it was really touching, right? So she had that in her, there's no question. But I think to deal with all of the obstacles, one of the first women you know, Japanese Canadian. The fact that she was short, she was sick and tired of looking up. I, I mean, she, she said, why, why am I always surrounded by tall men? At which point I st almost stood on my toes. I thought, you know, if I can get you to look up at me, that's great. I was 25, 26 when I got fired from this. Well, I was 25 when I met Margaret Lyons in the radio building. Uh, she offered me a job, which I first turned down, but eventually accepted. 
And so I flew to Toronto. I think it was the first time I'd ever been in Toronto and arrived in my cowboy boots and jeans and, and uh, got down to the old Jarvis Street where Current Affairs was and ushered into Margaret's office. And there she was sitting in her chair with her feet not touching the floor. She just said, well, they're letting you go in Calgary. So would you like to come and work here? Margaret was clearly recruiting. I mean, she was recruiting. She recruited Michael McEwen. She recruited Colin McLeod. She recruited um, Richard Bronstein, uh, a number of people. And, and, and the common denominator, <laughs> often the common denominator, was that they had been fired from their previous job or, or, or had stirred up some kind of trouble. No one in the history of CBC Radio has recruited as much amazing, complicated, difficult talent as, as Margaret Lyons. And I once asked her, uh, when she heard of me, she said, uh, I kept an eye on you when you were at McGill Daily in Montreal, which meant three, four years prior. I, I think she had a Rolodex of troublemakers or people who, uh, who uh, newspaper people in particular. Whether it's it's Starowitz or Alex Frame, or whether it's uh, whether it's Michael Enright or or Barbara Frum, uh, you go on and on and on. Barbara Frum had been gotten uh, displaced by uh, Ross McLean. She was the uh, the host of the current affairs portion of the Supper Time Show. Peter Zosky had gotten fired from McLean's. He had been the editor of McLean's. Um, Margaret was determined to introduce journalistic values. She, uh, that's, I think, the only reason I got hired, uh, because I was a newspaper man. And, uh, and she let me do outlandish things. I was working in the Prince Albert Penitentiary in Saskatchewan as a social worker. A friend of mine from university phoned and said, the host of my radio noon show has fallen ill. Could you get a couple of days off, drive down to Regina and fill in? I walked into a, the CBC building. It was a falling down old building on McIntyre Street. And I went, oh, this is what I want to do. This is journalism. I didn't know girls could do that, right? I knew nothing of Margaret Lyons until I actually arrived in Toronto. When I went to As It Happens, I think only then started to appreciate the revolution that was underway in radio, that she was allowing to happen and feeding and creating. Uh, As It Happens did some crazy, radical, wild things. It's hard for people to imagine and we would um, trade anything in the world for a phone number so that I, I had Indira Gandhi's home phone number. I, I won't even tell you how I had to do that, but it was really promising more than my firstborn to many. And some days were good, some days were bad. But, you know, it was a, a, the voice of the world, a day in the life of the world, which is kind of catchy. And, uh, and we played on that with, uh, this is as it has broadcasting, uh, you know, whatever it was, 1600 universal, coordinated universal time, whatever that is, nobody knew what that was. <laughs> broadcasting to the, the Atlantic United States and ships at sea we even had. <laughs> and people loved it. It was random and, and targeted and planned and crazy and all of those things, and you couldn't have done that anywhere uh, unless you had the support of the higher-ups. And Margaret was a higher-up. Margaret was totally behind that. Now, if you think you wet your pants if you're the executive producer of a program where you get up in the morning, whether or not you've got a tummy ache or not, and you've got to fill 90 minutes, Imagine being the manager responsible for what these idiots do in those intervening 10 hours. You've got to have a cast iron stomach. I mean, God knows what, these guys, these are babies when it comes to legal and libel and slander um, and accuracy. She 
supported this rather bizarre group of people that seemed the antithesis of a public broadcaster. And, and she could see that, and I think she could see in it and past it. And that was, I think, her brilliance, which is if you're going to be a visionary when it comes to redefining radio, which was her world, then that's a high-risk venture. And you have to, she had the confidence, I think, first and foremost in herself uh, to trust her own judgments about it, and then to trust the group of people that she had uh, put in charge of doing this. And then the players, those of us, the gang that, that were there. She kept it strong and alive and separate from the television world, which this is not a zero-sum game, and I think she understood that. I've always looked for people who uh, would take whatever we were doing one step beyond. We were uh, constantly debating in current affairs what we could do to make ourselves uh, uh, a more uh, significant force in the country. And we deliberately went out in As It Happens, in this country in the morning, to uh, carry out radical ideas of presentation. Margaret Lyons was a journalist, a dyed-in-wool, classic, BBC-trained journalist. Let me tell you a story. There was a character at As It Happens mm -hmm. called Max Allen. He drove me crazy. He was, you know, he came in around 11.30 in the morning, worked on his own stuff, didn't want to come to story meetings, but he was colorful. He had been working for a long time on a documentary called Dying of Lit. Believe it or not, in 1974, it was still not proven that lead is poisonous. And there were two companies, one of which was Canada Metals in the east end of Toronto, in Leslieville, that were smelters that were emitting lead. And there were documented cases, this is what the documentary was about, about brain-damaged children, licking paint, peeling paint, because it was a poorer area. So he did a documentary, meticulously documented, a documentary called Dying of Lead. And for once, we, uh, we let a reviewer hear it in advance, because as that happens, they usually run documentaries. We wanted to get some attention. And Blake Kirby, who was then the Globe's TV critic, reviewed it favorably, and that was that. And the documentary went on the air, and there was a knock on the studio door, and a man, you know, a man in a dirty trench coat, just like in the movies, just hands us a document. And I call legal, and we open it. Uh, and uh, it was an injunction barring us from saying this, 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 and this about Canada Metals. So, well, what do we do? Uh, and we found it in the transcript. It's all rolling around us on the air. Anyway, to make a long story short, we had to censor the program in midair. It was five, 10 kilohertz tone. And how do you feel what amounted to about three, four, five minutes it was? five minutes, oh, we read the injunction, you know, thereby committing every libel that we were enjoined not to say. But it was a public document. Well, that electrified everybody. Any other place in the country, you'd be in trouble. Margaret Lyons the next morning was delighted. We were the front page of the Global Mail. It was a courageous piece of journalism, which is the eternal credit of, of, uh, of Max Allen. Uh, and we did a world of good. The legacy that counts today is the journalism. The idea that, uh, that we exist in order to, uh, to inform and enlighten the, the democratic discourse. Either believe in that stuff or you don't. And she did. In the early 80s, I uh, had just left As It Happens and I'd moved to Metro Morning where I was producing this the Toronto morning radio show. And I'd taken with me some of the values from As It Happens and the ethos that we talked to the principal newsmakers of the day. So when um, uh, Trudeau appointed Donald MacDonald, um, I think it was to head up the Royal Commission, I figured, well, he lives in Rosedale, he's from Toronto, I can put him on Metro Morning. So we did, I was quite thrilled. And then the next day I get my carbon copy of this inter-office memo, which was sent to my station manager, saying, um, I imagine your producer is congratulating herself on getting Donald McDonald, but please remind her, hers is a Toronto program. She should only cover Toronto issues, make sure it never happens again. 
and it, it never happened again. <laughs> and she was managing director then, so she, she didn't miss anything. She, she was a walking journalistic policy book. Like she, not a policy book. She was a walking emblem of what um, a current affairs radio service could be, right? Honest and probing and, you know, um, not taking any bullshit. That was Margaret. That, she represented that as a, as a four foot eight walking person, right? Robert Harris had one foot in information radio and one in music. That, that extraordinary sense of taking those values of current affairs and applying them to the arts was such a break in the tradition of arts broadcasting in the CBC that literally went back to its founding in 1936. I mean, CBC didn't have a new service until 1941 in the war, you know? I mean, it, CBC was a cultural service. That's what it was. And in many ways, Margaret's um, and others' um, major contribution was to wrench it out of that artsy cultural frame and to put it into a current affairs political frame. And that invaded the arts. The kind of arguments and awful comments that came right from Vancouver to Halifax. How dare you? Letter after letter after letter. Margaret usually started by saying, so much of it is boring. And she's talking about the music. She's talking about the presentation. And in fact, she said time and time again, look, in radio, in all broadcasting, presentation is as important as the content, right? Not more important, as important. And that was really largely the success that she had in information programming, and I would say also in the arts and music programming. That was Margaret's spirit, clearly, right? That spirit of, we can do this. We can do things that no one has ever done before. Because we were looking for creativity. We were looking for people who were gonna do things differently, you know? And I think that's part of Margaret's legacy as well. Hi, this is Nancy White. The new schedule came into being in 1971-72, as it happens went daily in 1974, and then came Sunday morning. Last night I stayed awake, turning and tossing, thinking about people like Senator Lawson, bleeding the country dry. No, I was with the show from the very beginning, oddly enough. My assignment was to write songs about things that were happening in the news that particular week. The producers, the ones that like to sing often, Bob Carty loved to sing. He's a singer, he's a songwriter, so Bob Carty loved to do background vocals. And Stuart McLean did them sometimes. Um, Yvonne Fetzon never sang. It was great, fantastic people. I mean, goodness, quite a crowd. We had a picture in the office. It was a picture of um, Bernie Clark, who went over to interview Edie Amin. And he said, we saw that picture of Edie. Edie and Bernie, Bernie was terribly thin, and Edie, and Edie was kind of, Doug Forty, I guess you could say, and I knew that there was a, always a suspicion that if Bernie annoyed him, maybe he would just eat Bernie, you know what I mean? Because there were all those rumors going around, so these fun things. That, that CBC Sunday morning was a wonderful, wonderful experience. But once again, a team that worked together, all kids, I mean, I don't think anybody was over. If anybody was 30, I'd be surprised of the entire lot. Beth Haddon was on the Sunday morning foreign desk. You know, the last, the last uh, half hour was the international review, so it was entire foreign affairs, documentaries, commentaries, regular contributor Robert Fisk. I mean, good old Fisk. I remember when the phone rang on the foreign desk at the invasion of Sabra and Shatila in, must have been 1982, I think, and it was Fisk ready to file. I mean, it, you know, it was, a, so it was freelancers around the world. And then the core, the core documentary makers. It was provocative and energetic and innovative and I'm sure not beloved by everyone. A lot of people I, I deduce resented what Margaret Lyons would have done to CBC Radio, what she did to CBC Radio, because she took it in a populist direction. There was a constant battle between um, elitism versus populism, um, standards and quality versus ratings. And what, what we believed at Sunday morning, and that must have come from the top, is it's not one or the other. Our job, our job is to put forward quality, intelligent programming that, 
significant numbers of people would listen to or watch or care about. And that's how you built, you built the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. You built your base, you served your citizens. So, and I think that, you know, that was and remains the answer. It's not one or the other. That kind of programming was her vision. That's what she introduced. That's for the record, but that's a fact. So that's, that's a pretty big accomplishment. I mean, that's a good track record. We're talking 40 or 50 years. I mean, that's huge in media. All your life you wanted to be famous. She was kind of the boss, right? And uh, I must have met her. I must have been introduced to her at one point, but I, and I certainly would recognize her. And occasionally she would come by the office and be kind of a little hush. I just, I, I was nervous about her. I didn't want to meet her, really. She didn't have a cuddly demeanor. Like, you wouldn't go, hey, hey, Mrs. Lyons, I love your work. I was just gonna, the, the radio warrior, if I wrote a song about her, I would call it the, the radio warrior. Three fifty four Jarvis Street was the heart of the radio service. Twelve fifty five Bay Street was where the big decisions were made. Fresh off the triumph of As It Happens, Sunday morning, and the nation's love affair with Morningside, Margaret moved uptown, settled into the third floor at twelve fifty five. She ran first the AM network and then all of radio. I worked for two years as the executive assistant to the managing director, Clive Mason. And at that time, Margaret was the program director of the Radio One, we call it the AM Merton Network. And uh, she was at the end of the hall and I was at the other end of the hall. And one day she came in and she had just berated, I know that because I could hear it from my end, she had berated one of her male lieutenants uh, from Current Affairs. And, um, and then she came in and said, you know, this is, my lieutenant just has no self-respect. So I said, Margaret, Margaret, you've just emasculated him. You've just emasculated him. I mean, you're lucky because he's so well brought up, he didn't kick you, right? Well, Mr. Red, and then the, her retort always was, well, Mr. Redekop, you know, thank you. And then she'd storm out and then she'd come back. So the trick there was, don't do it often. She's listening. I think she didn't cut herself any slack, so she wasn't going to cut anybody else any slack either, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think if you, if you weren't, I think she was probably really tough on the people who worked for her too. And so, I, you know, she off with their heads kind of thing. Either you rise to the occasion, yeah, you rise to the occasion and you get on with it and stop, my mother often said, stop whinging, um, or you were out the door. I'm sure that that's what a lot of people experienced working for her. Yes, she, of course she could be cruel. Um, it was all part of it. Look, Margaret was a street fighter. She was a tactician, just a superb tactician for guerrilla warfare. She really, really was. Um, and office politics was guerrilla warfare at the CBC. That's what that was. I think she was probably less effective. I wouldn't say as, as a strategist. I mean, I don't think that was her top strength. Fighting battles, absolutely. She could win them all. Uh, but sometimes what was required was some kind of a strategic framework that you put it in. Now, I think she did move in that direction the higher she rose in, in, in rank at the CBC. And when she became a corporate officer, I think she did move into that area. But I, I wouldn't say that was her supreme strength. She always relished battles and how they could be fun on the street. She, you know, she always kind of reverted to that. A part of it was mischief. As Margaret aged and worked longer and harder hours, and I think she didn't like it being a, a vice president as much as it, because if you want to manage, you join a bank, you know. You don't want, you want to be in production if you're in radio and television. And I think that she probably missed it. As she moved up the corporate ladder and became vice president of radio, 
Margaret was by necessity increasingly removed from the parry and thrust of programming, the stuff that she loved. The part I regret is that uh, you have to drag out from yourself uh, those qualities that uh, you didn't know existed in yourself, uh, a sort of quiet calculation of the various options. You cannot afford to be intuitive and uh, uh, direct, immediately direct. You have to calculate um, the consequences of everything you say and do, which, is, which I found difficult to adjust to in the beginning. Eventually, you learn how to do it. You know, I saw another side of Margaret when she went back to London as the director of London. And she was full of gossip, uh, full of policy issues, and, and, and there were great analysis. But she wasn't having to manage people in that sense. Um, and, and so she relaxed. She was almost a, a different person. She loved participating in those co conferences and discussions, and she was good at it. She was a representative for the CBC overseas and, and, and for Canada. Um, but it was a different kind of Margaret, and she let go of some of that sternness, if I could put it that way. And I stayed with Margaret to, in, in this, the flat at the, the CBC had rented for her when I went to London. And we just had coffee in the morning and look at the newspapers and, and have a chat and off to Soho to some dive for dinner at night and or off to the London Philharmonic. And that's where I saw more, much more relaxed Margaret. I had a wonderful career in the CBC that was grounded by Margaret. And I never for one minute misunderstood my mission, which was to serve the people of this country. And, and that meant good journalism, it meant balance, it meant doing the unpredictable, it meant all of those kinds of things. Only in retrospect do you realize, holy God, we were backed. We were totally protected. We were defended. It was a highly politicized time, and it took guts to defend us. It's only when we all individually grew up and went on to become bosses and managers and leaders in that business and others that you think, whoa, that was an amazing uh, woman. Just her, her humanity, and she was not burned or, or, uh, or, or defensive or uh, cynical. She just believed in, in what this corporation was doing. I can't imagine another person being able to do what she did, like another Canadian who would have been able to do what she achieved because of the unique circumstances of her life, and of, of, of who she had become at that point in her life. Right? It was that Canada then that she grew up in, and, and all she did was embrace it even more and say, we can be special, we can be different, we can make our mark, and she wanted to be part of that. So if one of the real goals is to, it's hardly hard to unite Canada, but to kind of reflect honestly the nature of Canada, make people proud of being Canadian, Margaret has a big part uh, of, should have a big part of the credit for that. During the heyday of that, of, of CBC Radio, there was no radio service anywhere uh, that could rival uh, CBC Radio. And, and I, it, it's just an incredible achievement. I was very proud of my mother, and I'm still very proud of her, because I think she was really a trailblazer, um, and I think she did incredible things with her life. She had a huge life. I think she left a legacy of, of people who came after her who have done wonderful things in, in public broadcasting. Um, and I think she was really proud of that, that she, she had a legacy, that she'd left a legacy of these people who had made it who themselves have made a difference in public broadcasting. And I feel totally confident uh, that I can speak for her in this regard. I mean, you're still hearing her over my shoulder saying, well, okay, yeah, you can say that. She loved what she did, and um, I think she did a really good job at it. <laughs>